Uh, we thank uh, Dr. Guho uh, for her brief address. Now we move on straight away uh, to the first inaugural talk for today, which will be delivered by uh, Professor Daniel Rycock. Uh, Daniel has got an important meeting today, so he uh, will have to attend that. We'll move straight away to the talk. Before we hand it over to Daniel, briefly about Daniel Rycock. Uh, he is Associate Professor in the arts and cultures of Asia. Uh, may I request everyone, uh, Madam, I'm going to call it the attendance. Did you call it? Thank you. Um, Daniel Rycroft, I'm sorry uh, for the interruption, is Associate Professor in the arts and cultures of Asia at the University of East Anglia in Norwich, United Kingdom. He's a historical anthropologist who focuses on India's anthropological and cultural heritages. He's also chair of the uh, University of East Anglia's India Dialogue, which is a university-level program of international academic collaboration and exchange. His most uh, recent book is entitled The Humanities in India and Pluralist Pedagogy, published by Orion Blackstone in 2023. <clears throat> and his current research focuses on the emergent fields of academic social responsibility, which is an important area of research and work. Uh, this links to his long-standing interest in and contributions to Adivasi studies, as well as to broader questions of decolonization, especially in Eastern India. We're really grateful to Daniel Rycock for accepting our invitation. So it's over to you, Daniel, for your talk. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, I'm very, very honored to, to join you. Please, can you just give me a quick indication? How long would you like the talk to be in an ideal uh, scenario, please? We can take uh, 20 to 25 minutes. Okay, like. perfect. So again, thank you so much for inviting me to join. I am incredibly uh, pleased to be joining and privileged also. Um, I'm gonna also welcome uh, questions whether directly today I can stay for an hour uh, from now which should be fine for some questions um, or of course further further down the line um, after the session so I think it's a very important project that's being developed here um, it's path breaking it's uh, developing a whole series of different but also connected approaches uh, and uh, my talk today is going to really try and think through the uh, methodological uh, concerns here. Um, so as and when you know different people are involved in similar but um, perhaps also slightly distinct research processes, uh, you know I'm trying to think through what that means in terms of collaboration. So I'm going to start uh, by talking through one or two general concerns. I'm also going to give a little bit more detail about some of my own research, and then I'm going to arrive at um, uh, a phase of the talk that's going to go into more detail about uh, one uh, key notion, which is the notion of the syntagm. Uh, it's a linguistic uh, device, and it also has methodological ramifications. So that's really to be thinking about today. So the general points I wanted uh, today is whether we can establish a fully unified paradigm for all of these rather distinctive traditions, um, or may it be more sensible, more workable to have a pluralistic approach whereby different intellectual traditions, etc., can gain clarity, resonance in a more pluralistic space. Um, now, of course, when we think through the philosophy of unity in diversity, we can imagine that even if we're working with pluralistic uh, paradigms, they can also, or they can sort of lean in the same direction. They can speak with each other. Uh, and so this is where I think, you know, we're trying to understand the outcomes of this project. Um, we can think in terms of concepts like integration. Uh, are the paradigms that we're working with and working on and working for, are they integrative? Do they have the capacity to engage each other? 
I would think they probably do. I think, you know, this is one of the eth ethos points of the program is that we're not seeking out specific isolated intellectual traditions. We're, I think, perhaps rather trying to find sites of convergence, sites of future dialogue, zones of mutual understanding. And so it's this kind of space between the paradigms, which is as important as uh, the paradigms themselves. And I think the point I'm making here about Bengal's intellectual traditions is a point that has been established through this long century of decolonization. I think what we're th thinking through here is, uh, you know, questions around cultural identity, cultural diversity, cultural autonomy and self-reliance, and also the futures of these cultural traditions um, in a way that kind of echoes earlier debates around cultural diversity in India, pluralism in India, secularism in India, and so forth. So in historical terms, singularly historical terms, we can engage this project within a longer time frame. We can see it as being situated in some kind of conjunction with um, an existing uh, set of possibilities for this kind of, of research. And so the point I'm coming to when I'm going to be speaking about this syntagm is that we are actually therefore really concerned with the sequencing of these events. We're concerned with the outcome and outputs of this project after it kind of finishes, because that is our link to the future. And the syntagm basically in the shorthand is also not only about the sequence, it's about the linking. Okay, so that's probably enough on that uh, broader point for now. Um, in terms of a little bit more detail about my own approaches to historical anthropology and my own approaches to the India dialogue. So I've been working in the field of Adivasi studies uh, for some 20, 25 years. My first book was called Representing Rebellion. Uh, that was a project that explored the visual and political aspects of not only the Santal Rebellion uh, of 1855 to 1856, but also the colonial suppression of that rebellion and its visualization through the print media. My postdoctoral project resulted in a documentary film that was co-produced between myself and the Indian Confederation of Indigenous and Tribal Peoples called Hul Sengel, uh, the spirit of the Santal Rebellion. And since then, I've been doing a lot of work on projects that overall can be thought about in terms of academic social responsibility. So one such project is the uh, Purvajuni Ankh through the eye of the ancestors uh, work that I did that was about the visual repatriation of anthropological archives that documented and made visible different facets of Adivasi life um, from the early to mid 20th century. Visual repatriation in terms of moving these images out of the European archive in, into the Adivasi archive. <laughs> um, and this was a project that worked with the Vacha, the Museum of Voice, which is an Adivasi museum connected to the Basha Research and Publication Center. Um, I'm sure many of you know about Professor Ganesh Devi. Uh, so I worked with him and many of his colleagues around 10, 12 years ago um, on that. And I think there are some synergies between my participation in this project and that project, namely the, the, the sorry, the, the connection between community and archive. Um, so I, I probably want to think more about that with you if possible um, in the future. Because what I'm asking is the extent to which archives are community resources. Um, I think one of the ethos points behind this project is that 
the, the archive which is generated needs to have an ongoing social, educational, cultural, and also potentially economic resourcefulness um, uh, for people. Okay, so uh, that's a little bit about my research in Adivasi studies. In terms of the India dialogue, this is the University of East Anglia's commitment to putting forward or bringing about and nurturing opportunities for connection and collaboration, mainly in the academic scenarios, and usually in relation to different facets of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And so these 17 Sustainable Development Goals, I think pertain to some of the questions that have already been raised around climate anxiety and uh, the, the, the climate change issues, um, and also around questions in education. Uh, also around questions in society, namely enhancing uh, equality um, between different social groups and so forth. So the, the, these 17 SDGs are very wide ranging, um, but I think you know, what, you, what UEA brings to the table is this concern with academic social responsibility, which is kind of a pivot across which a whole series of different engagements with the SDGs can take place. And not only that, there can be a much broader engagement, not only with the SDGs, but maybe also with the principles that underpin the 17 SDGs. Uh, so there are the five principles and we also engage them. So why I'm going into this point in a little bit of depth is also to provide a context for how I connect with this program. Um, because uh, one of our ongoing academic collaborations is with the Jadavpur University in Calcutta, um, whereby we have an MOU, a very active and productive MOU, and where we have lots of faculty and research and pedagogic exchanges. And recently, or quite recently, we held a session on university social responsibility, which is a slightly more macro framing of social responsibility as distinct from the slightly more micro framing of academic social responsibility. Uh, and Professor Guha was there, and uh, along with Professor Gupta from Jadavpur, we've uh, established really important institutional commitments to this. And this is where I'm really excited about this project, because for me, in order for any of these things to work, it's not only about the commitment and purpose of the academic, it's also about the shared purpose with the institutions. Um, and so, you know, here we have different levels, different depths, different, almost sometimes different, but related sites of engagement. And the point is they all need to be in conjunction with each other. And I think they are, and that is why um, I think the future is, is bright. So the India Dialogue, of course, takes as its ethical and processual premise uh, the, the centrality of dialogue. And this can be taken at an interpersonal level. It can also be taken forward in terms of dialogues across time and space. So I'm very interested myself in historical dialogism. So how current affairs are thought about in relation to the past and also thought about, of course, in relation to the future. So there's this kind of future dialogic space which is also playing out. Okay, so moving forward then to think through what we mean by syntagm. Okay, so this is a word that's spelled S-Y-N-T-A-G-M, syntagm, which comes from semiotics. Originally it came from de Saussure uh, and his interests in analyzing European and Indian languages um, more than a hundred years ago, of course. So for me, there's also quite a nice link between what's going on here with its emphasis on language, potentially on lang language and ling linguistic cultures, as well as multilingualism. One of the important points when we talk about multilingualism in the context of Bengal at large, also West Bengal as a state, is the fact that lingualism pervades different facets of 
the Constitution. Um, the right for people to speak mother tongue is, is interesting. And it's also, of course, very important from the point of view of establishing cultural diversity and so forth. Um, and so I'm thinking more specifically about the work of the Eighth Schedule and, of course, the, the work of the Eighth Schedule in giving more opportunities for some Pali speakers to envisage professional and um, educational futures that connect to the Santali language rather than to any of the uh, dominant languages. So this, I think, is a, is, a, is a political process as well as a cultural one, and one that, in fact, gives us an indication as to how our university social responsibilities uh, can, be, can be mobilized uh, and thought about. That's just one instance. In terms of the syntagm, there's different ways of approaching it. You, we can approach it in terms of linguistic units that are given meaning and significance by their linkage. Um, we can also think about it in more processual terms rather than just in linguistics, in terms of thinking about how, for example, events have a start, a middle and the end and they're all connected. So that's just like a simple uh syntagm but it becomes more interesting when the sequence is actually part and it's thinking about and its interpretation becomes part of a, an interesting kind of expressive context and so people in film studies in literature think very carefully about the relationship of the different units in the overall creative output and so it could be that in this project, we want to bring some attention to the sigtambatic elements, namely the connections and linkages across time, across culture, and between uh, people and communities. So in the Santal context, there are a number of different syntagmatic elements which I've become interested in. You may have been familiar with the syntagm Sudukanu. This is a syntagm bringing together, on the one hand, one of the leaders of the rebellion, Sudu Murmu, with his brother, Kanu Murmu, and also their other brothers, Chand and Bhairo, and also their other affiliates in the movement. But leadership is thought about through just that one syntagm, namely Sudu Kanu and their linkage, and it's a familial linkage. It's also a political linkage. In cultural terms, their syntagm also played out through another syntagm, which is Sengelda. Do, does anybody know Sengelda? This is the fire cloud um, that spoke to Sidhu Murmu at the start of the rebellion. And it's also a um, title of a play about the rebellion uh, that was popular when I was working on the Hul Sengel project. And in fact, we took the Sengel from Sengel Da and brought the fire element Sengel into the title of our film, Hul Sengel. So the fire of the rebellion or the spirit of the rebellion. And as with all kinds of social historians that are interested in testimony, in the experience of difficult and traumatic events, this film sought to bring together a multiplicity of voices. And so you can imagine then my interest as director and co-producer in this film of thinking about how the different voice elements could be linked up. Okay, and so this is where within that cultural text of Hul Sengel, the syntagm as a feature becomes relevant and uh, also interesting. And not only that, it's not only about the bringing together of different voices, it's also about the bringing together of different subject positions of elders and young youngsters, of men, women, of musicians, poets, of people who are prominent in a discourse and people who are marginal in a discourse. So even within this framework of a Santali 
historic uh, Santal historical experience, we have multiple subject positions that become relatable through uh, the film. And so to work that out, to think that through, was a really interesting dialogue. And the final point around the syntagm in relation to Hul Sengel is that nowadays, it's not the fire cloud that has the significance. It's the memory of Sudu Murmu. So Sudu Murmu is now another syntagm. Okay, so some, you know, Sidhu, of course, the person Murmu is, of course, his family name. But we have a microtext there in his very name. So what we mean by that? And think also about what this means in terms of subaltern studies and subaltern history. We have Jibesh Chakrabarti's important work where he is bringing into play the question as to whether Takur Jiu's appearance to Sidhu Murmu, and along with that also the fire rain, whether that can become knowledge, uh, whether that can become uh, translatable outside of a Santal experience. And this goes really to the heart of some of the things we're thinking about, because you know, if we're interested in Buddhist or Jain or indeed any religion, to what extent do we recognize and engage these religious experiences as um, not only cultural texts, cultural experiences that tell us something about the people and the culture, but that can actually properly be communicated across cultures. So some elements I think are translatable, okay? You know, we can learn about each other. Some elements are untranslatable. Um, and so Dipesh Chakrabarti would argue that the fact that these, these phenomena appeared to the leaders of the rebellion, he would argue that's untranslatable because it's, he would argue it's sometimes specific. Now, in thinking about the, the questions of divinity, during and after the rebellion, we have a cultural transformation going on, whereby because people saw Sidhu Murmu and Kanu Murmu as immortal, they then become the vehicles for not only divinity, but connection between humanity and divinity. So they become the intermediation point. So we have in Jharkhand the scenario where Sidhu Murmu and Kanu Murmu achieve an afterlife. They also achieve not only an upscaling, but they also, through their upscaling, enable the microtext to become the macrotext, in, to enable uh, the particular forms and features of thinking that feed into the rebellion that we also have, of course, now echoes of when it comes to rights and aspirations of Adivasis. Not only that, but it also becomes the space in which people start to develop heritage consciousness, social consciousness, linguistic consciousness, class consciousness, and so forth. So this is why I'm interested in the kind of the multiple possibilities around um, Sidhu Murmu as a syntagm. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap up very, very soon. Um, I just think that the final point needs to really be around the possibilities not only to develop syntagmatic understanding and syntagmatic documentation, but also then to think about what any of that means in relation to the paradigms that perhaps may be more accessible to us. So there are certain paradigms that I am also working on. Uh, one is the paradigm of positive peace. And um, 
this is a paradigm that many of us are attuned to, given our understanding of the work, mainly of the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, but also in our own kind of scholar activist or administrator activist roles, where we're really thinking about the more harmonious, more peaceful, more integrated, more communica communication-centered um, realities that we're seeking for, that we're searching for. So positive peace, of course, is a, a compound word. You could also call it a syntagm, just in its linguistic framing. But it becomes paradigm paradigmatic because people are able to follow it through. They're able to develop it. They can theorize it and so forth. They can implement programs that um, enable it to happen in certain ways. And of course, what it refers to is not so much negative peace, which is the absence of conflict or the absence of war and so forth, but it's that capacity for human development, cultural development and so forth that can occur in that actual positive reality. So my final point then is to maybe make another kind of series of, of mini connections, which links up UNESCO's longstanding interest in positive peace, which, and I'll give you the sort of the, the historian's view on this, isn't so much, well, it is, of course, a post-war, you know, 1960s onwards kind of idea. But very interestingly, it got theorized in the interwar years and then got taken up after, um, you know, the, the various kind of political changes and uh, intellectual changes of the 1960s. But what it does do is take us to, I think, quite a sweet spot in this whole kind of scenario, which is one of the principles of the Sustainable Development Goals, which is peace. Um, so it's the fourth of the five P's, the five principles. And because it stands for not only positive peace, but also these very important, in my mind, qualities like human dignity and social justice, these, this is, these are the things that kind of are fed into that concept um, or, or that these are the things that kind of give the paradigm its, its feet. Um, these are very, very interesting and, 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 and very um, important um, because they both, well, both human dignity and social justice are the kind of uh, pivots across which human rights agendas um, typically get, get played out. And so, this is where I think you know we really need to be dialed into the the spaces of social responsibility that can bring everybody together. So thank you very much. Happy to discuss further with you all. Thank you, Daniel, uh, for your talk. Um, do you have time for one or two questions? Yeah, I have half an hour, okay, thank but please, please feel free to move on to the other speakers as well. I'd love to hear other people speak as well. Great. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, Daniel did talk about his experience um, of uh, what he called, and as he described, uh, academic social responsibility and uh, his work uh, on the the people whom we uh, call the Santali community people and uh, their epistemic resources. We did talk about the Adivasi Museum and the Research Center, which is an important uh, you know, repository of uh, different uh, cultural and intellectual resources uh, available uh, from which we can learn. So uh, I have a, a question on, on these, but before I uh, do hold my question. Is there anyone who would like to have a question for them? Do you have a question? You can come here. 
So, just quickly, just quickly, I think, yeah. Yeah, connecting to the metaphoric and metaphysical limit connection, I was making wrong. Yeah. Um, the, the whole thinking around metaphor and metonym is maybe for a, a later discussion okay, because okay, I think okay. that's. Okay. That's more to that's more to do with the the semiology and semiotic and all of this kind of understanding. I don't really want to go into that um, now, but I think it's a really good point, and uh, we can come back to that hopefully at another point. But in relation to the strategic use of a paradigm, I think it's because paradigms are more familiar to people, and I think they're good starting points. Um, and so they can, if they become a starting point, then they become syntagmatic because they also have effects. If you have a, if you're working with the paradigm of democracy or you're working with the paradigm of peace or you're working with the paradigm of rights, that's going to define your next steps. Okay, so whatever your next steps are, whatever the dialogue is, you can relate it to that baseline. Um, you can then also relate one paradigm to another paradigm and just it's a generalization, but I think typically paradigms are better understood than syntagms. But I think mm -hmm. in making any of these links, in really focusing properly on the dialogue, we are going to give ourselves a better opportunity to work productively with the syntagmatic relations. And that's my point. So that's why I think, you know, we can work strategically with paradigms, but we don't only want to maintain our connection to one paradigm or to work within that one space because that goes against the ethos of this whole project. So I'm thinking about two things. One is working with multiple paradigms. Think around, you know, all the metaphors of that, like polyphony, multilingualism, pluralism, all that kind of thing. But then also think about the practical elements. So what happens next if we start with one paradigm and then move to another. Or if we open up one paradigm to think about cause and effect, that then becomes much more workable through the syntagmatic idea. Of course, your other syntax is like refreshing rather. So all those the paradigm is much more known more than much more used to the paradigm arguments. I think that your micro the uh, choice of syntax is, uh, to me at least, it's a very refreshing and very promising. Thank you. Hello, Daniel. This is Arjun Jaji. My uh, question is that today, uh, your view, uh, when you're talking, about uh, your words that uh, the language preservation is coming up again and again. But uh, I just share my one experience. Uh, in the Boro language, a 
boy who can speak and write uh, his own language, Boro, or others, Adivasi language. Uh, but uh, that boy is giving a uh, uh, job in post office and others in uh, uh, government, in banking sector or other uh, sector. Then what is the future of uh, this Adivasi language? Mm. And, and You're absolutely uh, right to raise this question. And, and, I. Yeah, and I not only that, not only mm. that um, uh, they are always at, uh, uh, always apply or always raise the voice that uh, uh, he he never being admitted to the language institution or even they that reason that very little activity on their language and uh, uh, in in the, that their places uh, it appears that English or Hindi is the first language in the, that school. So, mm. how do you see this problem? You know, uh, I see the problem through this idea, which I think has some traction in, in uh, sociology and anthropology, which is this problem of cognitive injustice. Okay, so uh, the kind of the cognitive and sort of impact on one's brain, impact on one's capacity to think um, which is coming into our experience when some languages aren't allowed to flourish okay and when suppose somebody is multilingual like the person you're referring to is multilingual if they start to think that one language is habitually inferiorized or one language is habitually dominated by another that's going to lend itself to some sort of cognitive difficulties um, because with that will come the prospect that you know what is being thought about in the subordinated language is less important or for whatever reason more difficult to communicate than the other uh, feature so it's an it's going to be almost impossible to resolve this but it's very very important to address it i think um because i think if we're talking about adivasi languages and if we're talking about social inclusion which is what i think we are talking about and social justice and all of the social responsibilities that then we need to attend to we can, in a sense, think that think these problems through, both at the micro context in relation to specific individuals. I think we need to have experience here being shared wherever possible by people who've experienced not only cognitive injustice, but also linguistic injustice, so that we can then, you know, figure that sort of figure that out in terms of people's experiences and so forth. But then we also need, to, I think, to think about it from the point of view of educational and administrative and social institutions. Uh, so that it's not just like one person's problem, but it becomes a shared uh, problem. Thank you. Any, any more questions? Yeah. Okay. So we can come here also. Uh, thank you, Professor Roycroft. Uh, taking forward your idea of uh, syntactic thinking, um, justice, uh, I'd like to say that social justice or questions of economic justice, they are connected to, you know, the question of epistemic justice. So mm. once, um, I mean, until we recognize that they also, you know, think they also can, <coughs> they have their own epistemics. Uh, we are not going to give them that kind of agency. Uh, so, uh, as a scholar who has worked for several years, maybe more than 20 years among the bosses of India, uh, what are the problems that you, you know, you found uh, in retrieving, quote-unquote retrieving, because I don't know whether we can use this word retrieving or not, the thoughts, the thinking patterns of the bosses of India, 
do you find any documentary evidence because there are lack of that uh, so i mean how to address this you know how to uh, you know collect or you know take stock of the you know thoughts and ideas of the universities of india uh, that's my Thank you so much. It's a really interesting question. It's also a huge question. Um, <laughs> forgive me if I can't give it a, a macro answer. It is very much a big question. And uh, just by way of an anecdote, I mean, my institution loves to get um, all of the colleagues to think through big questions and to raise big questions. So you're kind of on, on my page when it comes to, 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 to thinking about and then asking big questions. So I really love that. Um, can I just go back to you very quickly? When you said quote unquote something, I didn't actually hear the word because the microphone wasn't functioning. Can you repeat what you said when you said quote unquote? Retrieving and recuperating of those. I mean, once again, the question of your agency comes who is retrieving, who is recuperating? That's why I put it in quote unquote. No. Agency. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Daniel, he's, he's putting the word retrieving or recuperating, putting both, because this is a recuperating. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm sure many of us are familiar with the excellent work of the now um, late Mahaswata Devi, okay, where she put in so much of her creative and human resourcefulness to explore some of these features. So I think we can get a sense as to what the issues are through that ethnography. It's a creative ethnography. I mean, there's no doubt about it. It's not evidence-based as such. It's, it's experience-based. Um, and she's working with the human experiencing. She's working with... Um, you know, her perception and her creativity. But she's, I think, a very important interlocutor between more dominant and more marginal communities, between constitutional values and Adivasi human experiences. I also want to highlight the work of the late Pashupati Prasad Mahato, who was my teacher um, when I first worked uh, with, with him and various colleagues at the Anthropological Survey of India. And he went on to have you know, a very distinguished career, career in anthropology and also um, worked closely with the Asiatic Society. And his point was really to think about why and how all of these oppressive mechanisms impede Adivasis, and he would also argue that as a large category, not only the Shedral tribes, but also all Dali and OBC uh, communities. How he would really want us to think through, why are we internalizing these, these ideas? And he is very provocative. And a lot of what he did was speaking back. And so this is why I think, you know, we're again on the same page because we're working together to try and address and hopefully resolve some of the epistemic challenges that need to be resolved so that we don't reproduce the systems of inequality the languages of inequality that we are all wanting to confront perhaps for a whole range of of reasons but what is at the heart of it, I think, is, of course, social, cognitive, epistemic, economic justice in the present. Okay, we None of us like to see violence, embedded violence, or any, any such variant of that. I think many of us want to see all of the near-term, near like short-term, mid-term, long-term futures to be you know, differently conceived, differently operated, in a sense, made functional through a different kind of authority or a different kind of agency. And this is where I, you know, I, I come back to, to your question directly, which is around, well, what, what does the Adivasi kind of offer any, anyone else? Well, surely it is insight into that experience of being Adivasi, okay? 
Being Adivasi is a different proposition from being tribal. Being tribal is premised on all of these anthropological ideas around, you know, cultural distinctiveness, linguistic distinctiveness, kinship distinctiveness, and so forth. But being Adivasi is, is about all the kind of connections that stem outwards from that tribal subjectivity into a world of other indigenous peoples, other non-indigenous peoples, other non-tribal peoples. So this is why I'm very keen to get us to think not so much about tribal cultures and tribal institutions, even though, of course, these are very, very important, but to shift the language, to translate the language into the space of Adivasi hood, because there we get the, the opportunity to think of the convergence between the, the lived realities and uh, the uh, kind of political and economic structures and, uh, and systems. And so each of us has an understanding of those <coughs> socioeconomic and political structures and systems. And uh, some of us also know why the, you know, across any society, uh, the minorities are minorities because they have been historically excluded from the privileges that are therein uh, mobilized and made beneficial, of course, to certain people. So this is perhaps the point where we, again, I, I come back to my earlier terminology. We have the minority paradigm, which is the constitutional safeguards for scheduled tribes, scheduled castes, minorities, vulnerable people, vulnerable populations, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, that, those are the paradigms. They are there in the constitutional framework, in the constitutional safeguards, in the constitutional process. But the minority syntagm is about, okay, well, what do they actually achieve in anybody's life experience? How do they relate? To each other like how can they be mobilized how can they translate out into um people's life experiences and this is why i think you know through this project if we could get to a point whereby we're not only working on micro texts as cultural phenomena but we're also working on macro texts in terms of social and political transformations then i think you know we're we're going to be working, you know, that much more into the future. Looking at that term, just like minority paradigm and minority syntagm, are you actually pointing to Adi versus syntagm? From Adi versus from paradigm? It's multiple. It's multiple. It can be any. It can be anybody's. It can be the life experience. Exactly. Exactly. I can be also from my own experience, from my own yeah. point of location. It's completely new kind, new uh, completely fresh. Adivasi down can start from here, here and now. So, so in my book. The Humanities in India, um, there's a whole chapter on the concept of the non Adivasi, <laughs> which goes into quite a lot of detail about this point. Because the non Adivasi, in my, in my use of the term, isn't just alluding to somebody who's not Adivasi, rather, is somebody who is not Adivasi but has a syntagmatic linkage to Adivasi life experiences and realities. So Ashok Kumar Sen, Sangeeta Das Gupta, Sanjukta Das Gupta, Shantan Das Gupta in the present, etc. etc. Pashupati Mahato in the past. In official terms, he is non-Adivasi, he's he's OBC, but he thought himself as Adivasi. 
So that's a productive syntagmatic link into the Adivasi paradigm. And I would say, because of my pluralistic viewpoint, that we need to account for not only Adivasi accounts of Adivasi hood, but also non-Adivasi accounts, because they can be important bridges. Think of Mahaswata Devi as well. It's so important, I think, to have a sense of to what happens on the boundary that stretches out of the Adivasi paradigm or Adivasi life world into non-Adivasi. Because then we can think about what's actually been going on in terms of either representation or misrepresentation, in, in terms of understanding or misunderstanding, and so forth. And so it it does involve non-Adivasis. Yeah, I think I think I, I think so. And but but also of course Adivasis have 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 paradigm. <laughs> paradigm. Oh, Adiv uh, paradigm. I'm not Adivas in It's both experiencing. I'm exp I'm I'm trying to well, kind of re re live the experience of Adivasi through my uh well kind of personal observation that can can be a kind of that's a, that's a nice way of, of kind of that I think is a nice way of thinking about the ambiguity in much of this. So think of Swaraj. Uh, we have, of course, Gandhian Swaraj. We have more modern day intellectual Swaraj, okay, which is about the decolonization of ideas. It's a capa the capacity for people to think beyond and against all of these systems and patterns and histories of control and domination. And so going back to the earlier question, yeah, we can approach some Adivasi thinkers in relation to this, what you might call kind of subalternist idea. But what they are, I think, less able to do is to think about, think about it in terms of its effects in Adivasi context. They think about it, of course, in terms of literary context. But so this is why we need the interdisciplinarity. This is why we need ethnographers, Adivasi activists, all kinds of activists, all kinds of um, historians, sociologists, linguistic, translators, everybody. It's, it's very inclusive in that sense. But the point is that Adivasi autonomy or Adivasi agency in political structures is sometimes pronounced as Adivasi self-rule, Adivasi Swaraj. And so let's again, perhaps try and unpack that, that paradigm. It's going to be interesting for us, and it takes us into a space where we can answer the question that I started with, which is the extent to which whatever macro texts are generated through this project, whatever micro texts are generated, we can get a better understanding as to what needs to be, in a sense, brought about in relation to who's ordering pattern like who has the kind of say in whether we can use swaraj as a category yeah if we do then we can bring adivasi swaraj into that space into that paradigm it can be part of its vitality part of its sense of coherence and cohesion alternatively do we want to package 
all of the Adivasi microtexts, all of the Adi Adivasi macrotexts into the Adivasi paradigm rather than the Swaraj paradigm. The, so these are kind of really interesting, but I think really important processes to think through when we're thinking about the meaning of the work that's going on here. Um, and so, you know, I'm happy to leave that point there. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. So Daniel has an important meeting to attend. So we have to, the person and the person was doing very well, but uh, we know that uh, Daniel has to leave and we have uh, the next talk as well. But uh, we are sure that the conversation that began today, it will continue and we'll keep learning from uh, Daniel Rykov's work. And uh, there is a possibility that uh, Daniel will visit uh, Kolkata maybe in June, yeah. as he said, so we will have opportunities to uh, talk to him in person. <coughs> Thank you so much again, Daniel, uh, for the talk and for all the personnel. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, thank you so much.